Welcome to Author Intelligence, where writing meets innovation. Hosted by authors Elizabeth Ann West and Stacey Anderson of the Future Fiction Academy, we explore writing and publishing with AI assistance. Hey, Elizabeth. Hey, Stacey. This episode is uh, AI changes so quickly. So how do we keep up? What are our secrets, right? Yes. So we have a unique advantage running the Future Fiction Academy. This is our job. Yeah. So I've always been someone that I can memorize. Use Like, I'm really a good member for your pub trivia team. Like, I am full of useless information. I'm really good at Jeopardy. And when AI started coming around, I was someone that was almost like a savant in terms of like, I could just rattle off all of the context windows and how much money stuff would cost and do the math and like, no, that model is this. And I can remember one time in the FFA teaching people like, you have to memorize these, like the basic foundation models at the time. I no longer tell people to memorize stuff because there's just too many. It's too many. It updates too quickly. That's it, It's a constant flux. Yeah, but you have to know where to find the information, not have a Rolodex in your head. I just had an interview with Jane Friedman, the wonderful Jane Friedman in the hot sheet. For those who don't know, she's got a fantastic industry newsletter, email newsletter. You subscribe. It's a one-time fee for the year, but you can also get a free couple free ones. But she has a lot of great information about AI news, stuff in publishing, just like broad spectrum of the publishing industry. But she did an interview with me on AI and I felt bad because we recorded that in July. And by August, when the email came out, I had told her in July, like none of the models could do more than about 2,000 to 3,000 decent words in one output. But in August, we got GPT-40 mini, which has a context output of 16,000 tokens, which hypothetically could be as many as 12,000 words. I don't know anyone who has managed to make it write 12,000 words. We're still working on that. But um, most I've gotten it to write is 7,000. I don't know. Have you gotten it to write a whole bunch? Five, six, but five six still, that's more than the two, double word you had told her that before. Yeah, it was double. I don't want anyone to feel like we are somehow more advanced or more special than those of you who are listening to author intelligence right now. We are not. We are just authors who like technology. I mean, I don't have a degree in computer science. Do you, do you have a master's in business administration, right? I got a degree yeah. in leader. There's no, like neither one of us mastered in computer science or anything like that. So um, so I think we should talk about some of the ways that we stay on top of it. So as you said, teach a man to fish. This is because just by the very nature of it, we record these things a couple of weeks in advance. We don't want to be your full source of information. For some of you who are listening, we want you to be able to stay on like the cutting edge if you if you would like to. And so these are the methodologies to do so. When did you realize that you really kind of needed to stay on top of AI? Because you were a little, you didn't start the FFA with me, for those who don't know. Stacey came like two months later, but she was there early on and we'd known each other for years. But what was the point in your career, if you can remember, that you realized AI was something that you needed to like keep a track, keep a, keep a keen eye on? I had tried Pseudorite as early as 2020. Mm. And so I was even earlier than you. Like, <laughs> I remember listening to an Undo Independence podcast and I tried it out and it seemed very kitschy. It's like when smartphones first came out, I had gotten one and I said, why would I need this? Yeah. Went back to a, a dumb phone for a little while and now I can't live without my smartphone. I was going to think I had tried it, but it just seemed like, okay, it's neat. But at the time it could give you some imagery, okay. some sentences. Yeah, it you know, wasn't writing for you. It was about, what was that, November 2022 when the GPT OpenAI came out? That GPT launched November of 2022, and I think that's when everything changed for everyone. Now, the year prior to that was when I found Playground and Pseudorite, and I was starting to go deeper into uh, the models and everything. Like yeah, that. I was starting to play with it a little bit beforehand, but when I saw that come out, yeah, that was when I went, wow, this is going to change everything. Yeah. You know, I kind of want to go back and watch some YouTube videos of the OG chat GBT, just so like we should do this for the FFA, like a party thing. <laughs> like we're just watching some old stuff. <laughs> How far we've come. Uh, Dr. Ethan Mollick, uh, the professor on LinkedIn, he just posted a sub stack. This is really great to read. 
that was comparing stuff from just 18 months apart. So like, here's where a video was 18 months ago. Here's where it is now. Here's text from 18 months ago. Here's the text wasn't that great. I'll be honest, the, the test that he chose, but the, the visuals, it was really eye opening how much changed in 18 months. I was about to say, I could probably go back because in the early days, I was paranoid about saving all of my outputs. Like, I'm like, oh, I have to keep all of these. I had archive files. I'm now. shocked. Yeah. I'm shocked and surprised that you, Stacey Anderson, kept a digital archive of everything you ran in the AI. I'm, I'm, I'm surprised. Yeah, I've given that up. How many, how many backup systems is it on? So I could probably go dig up some of my old generations that blew my mind at the time and go, no, I'd hit regenerate now. I would reject that. Okay. Um, and, you know, there was a time when you could go back in the playground on OpenAI and like play with older models. A lot of those older models they've taken down, they no longer provide them anymore. And they're now starting to sunset them like Windows operating systems. So you can't always go back and play with the old models. Unless you download them, which OpenAI did not allow. So it's, I'm sure people are out there capturing, uh, chronicling and capturing our, our progress and all that. So when stuff comes out, I think the first thing that we usually look at, well, usually what happens is something drops and one of the three of us, either Stacy, myself, or Seth Pajonas, will like send out an APB. Like the text message will come through no matter what time of day it is. And like, blah, 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 just dropped. Like 3.5 Sonnet just dropped. Or, yep. on, or a mini. Well, you gave us the alert the other day about the price price slash on Google Flash. Gemini 1.5. Gemini. Yeah. yeah, Gemini 1.5 just matched the pricing of um, GPT-40 mini. So you have a little bit of my savantness still there where I can remember what things are, but it gets it gets a little tongue twistery, I will say. Because uh, I call it a Google Flash, but it's Gemini. With the model, uh, <laughs> I have a tendency just to call it the Google model. Yeah, well, they have other models, but nobody uses them. Like there's Vertex, there's Gemma, there was another one, Palm. Palm was a thing. Palm that was has morphed into Gemini, I believe. In yeah. my latest class on Gemini, I had a whole flow charts. Oh, because you were in the LLM notebooks, right? Yes. Uh, yeah, that's a really cool high technical thing. Okay, so the very first thing that we do is we kind of get it from the horse's mouth, right? Like a model drops and the first thing we do is we go to their website. And uh, I'm going to share my screen just to show we are not any different from you. Okay, so this is literally a tactic that I have used multiple times. So I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to read it out. So over here I have the OpenAI. This is from July 18th, 2024. So it's a recent example. GPT-40 Mini, Advancing Cost-Efficient Intelligence, Introducing Our Most Cost-Efficient Small Model. Now, one thing to know is that a lot of the jargon that they throw out is very marketing-oriented, right? It didn't really tell me any technical specs there. It just put a lot of words, bingo words, if you were, when a model comes out. But then in the very first paragraph, uh, we have OpenAI is committed to making intelligence as broadly accessible as possible. Today, we are announcing GPT-40 Mini, our most cost-efficient small model. Cool. I'm with them for that. This is where my brain goes. I don't know what those words mean. We expect GPT-40 Mini will significantly expand the range of applications built with AI by making intelligence much more affordable. I'm good there too. GPT-40 Mini scores 82% on MMLU and currently outperforms GTP-41 on chat preferences in LMSYS leaderboard. What? What? What's the MMLU? And what the heck is the LMSYS leaderboard? Now, there is a link here. And if I click that link, it does take me to arena.lmsys.org. And then it's like, I have to agree, which kind of makes me nervous, but sure, I'll agree to the Creative Commons. And then I get this chatbot arena where you can actually battle things side by side and <laughs> you can put stuff in here with uh, the chat. So uh, you can model A, you can choose one. Actually, I think I remember Rochelle Ayala sharing this tool uh -huh. way back last year with us. So I went to the arena side by side. You can do all these different models that are here from different things, including like Gemini. So if I pick like Gemini 0801, which is the new one, 
and we have 40 mini which is there although i don't think that's a fair comparison i think i should do the gpt 40 2024 0806 i think those are actually or no you're saying gemini pro matched the pricing of 40 mini right yes i believe so okay so we'll compare it to mini then what you can do is, I guess, the descriptions. So it has all the information about these for some of these. And so at the bottom, I put my prompt. So I could say outline for me an Insta love romance. Sound like a plan? Mm -hmm. Between two celestial beings influenced by Romeo and Juliet. And sun and moon. There we go. So that's my prompt. And I'll click send. Now, what's cool about this is that it's going to simultaneously have both models respond to this. So you can actually put them in head to head. This is a really great way to test when new models come out. Is it worth the darn for you to even learn this? So you could pick your favorite model on this, share a prompt that you like, and then you could have the new model so that you can compare it and see if it's worth it. Um, speed, I would say they're both equally speedy. <laughs> uh, Mini's still going. Mini uh, did not quite finish. Um, so, and then it asks you to like, A is better, B is better, tie, or both are bad. So I'm going to look at this and I don't know if all of them, so this one did outline, this one did finish, this one did not. I don't know if I can dink it for that because I don't know what they're doing to control the outputs, you know? All right, so I'm trying to scroll down here. Forbidden Love and Introduction, Act One of Romeo and Juliet. So Google took a very literal <laughs> understanding of this. Celestial Ball hosted by Cosmos King and Queen celebrating the harmony of the universe. Soul, a radiant, powerful being of pure light and Luna. Conflict, opposing House of Day and House of Night, locks in an ancient feud. They secretly meet and dance, their conversation filled, and then we have secret meetings and growing love. I don't love this. I think that this is not really an advance on anything that I would have gotten out of 16.5. No. Now here on the GPT-40 Mini, Eclipse of Hearts, Fantasy Romance. So it picked the genre, which is interesting because I didn't give it the genre. Setting, a mystical realm where celestial beings reside, divided into two kingdoms, Solara, the realm of the sun, Lunara, realm of the moon. Solara is bright, vibrant, and energetic, filled with golden landscapes and sunlit gardens. Lunara is serene, ethereal, and tranquil, with silver forests and shimmering lakes under a starry sky. I think that GPT-40 Mini did a better job at grounding me in this story than... 40 Mini kept a better job of being true to the, the inspiration without being as on the nose as Gemini did here. Exactly. And even this plot outline. So just to compare you guys for you, one on Google said, Forbidden Love and Introduction, Act One of Romeo and Juliet, setting a grand celestial ball hosted by the cosmos king and queen celebrating the harmony of the universe. I had no information about what the setting is. Character, soul, a radiant, powerful being of pure light, representing the sun, bold, passionate, and a little reckless. Luna, a serene, ethereal being of silver light, representing the moon, gentle, introspective, but with hidden depths of strength. Then we have the conflict. Soul and Luna begin, belong to opposing celestial houses, the house of day and the house of night, locked in an ancient feud over the balance of the universe. Their love is forbidden. Meeting, and it just does it like that. It's it's very theoretical is the best way. Yeah. To over here on GPT-40 Mini, plot outline, act one, the forbidden encounter. Number one, introduction to the realms. Establish the tension between Solara and Lunara, where the two realms have been at odds for centuries, each believing they are superior. Introduce the celestial festival that occurs once every hundred years when the sun and moon align, allowing beings from both realms to bingle. The festival, Calum, eager to, ex eager to explore, sneaks away from his royal duties to attend the festival. Selene, Curious about the world outside her moonlit kingdom, also attends the festival out of duty, but desires to break free from her shelter life. The first meeting. Amidst the vibrant festivities, Caleb and Celine lock eyes during a moment of celestial dance. Time stands still as they are drawn together. They share a fleeting conversation filled with chemistry, laughter, and a sense of connection that feels predestined. If I put that outline into any AI model, I'm going to get a scene that I really enjoy reading. I don't know that I'm going to get that with the Google Gemini. No. So the vote. Uh, B is better. 
I think so. That's my vote, at least. I agree, too. Let us know in the comments if you disagree. So we did our part. We we joined the arena. Yeah, yes. <laughs> okay. But more to the point, back to what ChatGPT said. Um, i now sharing a screen here of a ChatGPT conversation. And uh, Stacey, do you ever do this where you take un uncommon vernacular or whatever from like the model cards and stuff and just throw it into chat and have it explain it to you? Yeah, even if it's something I think I understand, but they're describing it in a way, you can not only have them describe it, you can have them use metaphors, use analogies, break it down like I'm a five-year-old. Like there's usually some aspect of it I haven't fully grasped or understood that ironically the AI can do better in explaining how the AI works. Yeah, I used it uh, a few weeks ago. I was, I've been working on learning how to code and everything like that. And there was one about understanding tensors for machine learning. <laughs> I read it the very dry white paper from Google about tensors. And I was like, I don't get this at all. But to, to put it, I understand the matrix now. I get it. Matrices, not the matrix, but matrices. Okay, so here's the prompts that I did. Help me, I don't understand this. And I did a colon. And then I put the quotation marks. We expect GPT-40 Mini will significantly expand the range of applications built with AI by making intelligence much more affordable. GPT-40 Mini scores 82% on MMLU and currently outperforms GPT-41 on chat preferences in LMSYS leaderboard opens in a new window. And then I closed my parentheses or my, my quotation marks. And I said, what is the MMLU? It sounds like the Marvel universe, right? <laughs> the <MMLU>. Yeah. <laughs> What is the MMLU, an MLMSYS leaderboard in layman's terms for an author? And it wrote back to me, the MMLU, Massive Multitask Language Understanding, is a benchmark that tests an AI's knowledge and reasoning across a wide range of subjects. Think of it as a big exam where the AI is tested on topics like science, history, math, and more, similar to a high school or college test. Scoring 82% means this AI model is quite smart and performs well on that exam. The LMSYS leaderboard is like a ranking system that shows which AI models people prefer when they chat with them. It's similar to a top 10 list of favorite books or authors, but in this case, it's about which AI people think gives better, more helpful responses and conversation. So in simple terms, GPT-40 Mini is good at a broad range of subjects, like getting an 82% on a big test, and ranks high on a list where people say they prefer chatting with it. I think that's a good balance, too, because it shows factually which is better at answering questions but then the human element which one people prefer yeah um just like both of the gemini and the 4o that we just showed gave factual outputs they gave outlines that fulfilled the requirements Brief, yeah. romeo and juliet fantasy but or insta love but definitely had a preference of one over the other so that is very helpful in conjunction with the two, uh, showing which one could be better for use or better suited for your task. Yeah, a thousand percent. I'm not using that Google Gemini outline. And I'm actually disappointed because the last couple of weeks I've actually gotten really good outlines out of 0801. So I, you know, and it's kind of like any given generation. So that particular LMS, LMSYS.org arena is designed for head to head. But, you know, really and truly, you don't want to just go off of one generation because you could have gotten a bad click. Or your prompt could have been better suited for one model over the other. Absolutely. That's another key thing, too. So there's there's a science to this, but there's also very much an art. <laughs> and I don't think the people who build these systems and stuff are really too keen on the art aspect of prompt engineering. <laughs> Or the art is hard to classify. Mm -hmm. Like you can give the factual answers and a score of 82%. You can't give the artistic side such a concrete score. Right. And there may be some authors that would have preferred that Gemini outline just because they want more of a backbone that they hang the flesh on. I don't. I want more of concrete ideas that I can visualize the scene in and then make those changes. So it really is also sometimes down to just personal preference. I don't know anybody who'd want that Gemini outline, but there might have been somebody out there. <laughs> like, I just want a basics. 
Okay, so going to the source. Um, there, whenever an AI model, they're going to release a blog, and then they're also going to release like a PDF model card thing. Um, white page. Yeah, a white page, white paper or whatever. Those things. If melatonin's not working, great material to read right before you go to bed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, we actually have a YouTube video where, uh, I believe it's a YouTube video, where I went through... It's not, I, if it's not a YouTube video, it's definitely a class in the FFA where I went through 60, uh, 47 pages of PDF that was the release for Claude 3. So when Claude 3 came out, Sonnet, Opus, and um, Haiku, there, and actually, we didn't get Haiku right away. Remember, they held that back. Oh, yeah. We yeah. only released Sonnet and Opus, and they're like, Haiku is coming. But um, the 40 something page white paper, I went through it with a fine tooth comb and showed students how you can go through it. And, same thing. There'll always be a PDF. Usually you can look for it, search for it on open source models. The PDF stuff will be on Hugging Face. If you go to that website, it looks scary. It looks like I'm somewhere I might break something. You're not. It's just a lot of words and vocabulary that's unfamiliar because this is a whole new field. So I don't go to Hugging Face that often. Do you? Not often. Usually if I just do a Google search for plot three white paper it'll bring it up um i will admit i go to hugging face if i do a prompt and i can't get a model to work i'll go finally go look at the model card and see if there's information about because first last year there was different ways of prompting that they were doing the training set like vacuna i don't know what it is but mistral for a little while there it was like a two-stepper is really how it was trained and that does matter like how things are trained makes a difference for when you go to prompt it Okay, so yeah, model cards. Don't understand? Take the language to an AI. I am curious. I want to do one little experiment, one last little experiment here because we showed ChatGPT talking about GPT-4. What do you think about asking Claude for that, for a same explanation? Just in case, to see if there's bias, see, right? Yeah, let's see. So I'm going to grab the exact same prompt here that helped me. I don't understand this, but I already read out loud. So I'm going to throw this into the Claude chat. Um, it's going to use 3.5 Sonnet, which is fine. And I'm going to press center. I understand your confusion. Let me break this down for you in simpler terms. MMLU, mul mul Massive Multitask Language Understanding. MMLU is a benchmark test used to evaluate how well AI language models perform across a wide range of subjects and tasks. It's like a standardized test for AI, covering topics from science and math to ethics and law. Okay, so it gave me different information because the other one said history. The score of 82% means this AI model, GPT-4 or many, correctly answered 82% of the questions in this test, which is quite impressive. LMSYS leaderboard. This is a ranking system for AI language models similar to sports rankings. So it didn't understand when I said layman's terms for an author. It was like sports ranking. It compares different AI models based on how well they perform in conversations. The leaderboard is maintained by a group called LMSYS language model systems. Chat preferences. This refers to how humans prefer one AI's com like. Honestly, I like ChatGPT's answer better. <laughs> if oh, I but look at the bottom. As okay. an author, you can think of it this way. Here we go. MMLU is like a comprehensive exam testing an AI's knowledge across many subjects. The LMSS, the LMSYS leaderboard is like bestseller list for books, but for AI models instead. The chat preference is similar to readers preferring one author's writing style over another's. The overall message is that this new AI model is performing very well on standard tests and in conversation with humans while being more affordable than some other high-performing AI models. This could make advanced AI capabilities more accessible for various applications. Would you like me to elaborate on any part of this explanation? So it turns out the models don't even have bias against each other's models, which is pretty funny. Yeah. <laughs> even Claude will say nice things about 4.0 Mini. We could learn from the harmony that is uh, AI models. All right, so we talked about AI models. We talked about Hugging Face and different websites. Next thing, I always do this on, I actually watch this in, for breakfast. Like if I'm eating my breakfast, I watch it. I watch YouTube or lunch. How do you use YouTube for staying on top of the AI changes? Um, yeah, there's a couple channels that I kind of just go to. There are a few that are just regularly updating mm -hmm. the current events or just new applications. Um, yep. Sometimes there's some fluff in there or rehashing more applications than I need, but it's still very helpful. 
Mm -hmm. And we have to be careful because AI is in the forefront of the news, people's consciousness right now. It is a heavily talked about topic. Yeah. Therefore, there is a a lot of advertising revenue going to channels like this. So there is a lot of clickbait out there. There's a lot of fluff out there. There are a lot of people trying to get a piece of the YouTube revenue or wherever just by putting out anything. Right. But often it's not wrong. It's just not helpful information. You're wasting your time. Yeah. It's it, the actual video will be about speculation. But the title will make it seem like something's already out. I'll give a really good example. ChatGPT 5 at the time of us recording this is not out. Not out for anybody. I don't even know of anybody who's in a testing program for it or anything like that. But maybe there is some stuff on the back end. I don't know. But you'll if you search ChatGPT 5 on YouTube, you'll see all kinds of videos that claim this or that will be in chat GPT-5 and it makes it seem like that is news and you click on it, but then you realize that they're just speculating because again, chat GPT-5 is not currently out. I can guarantee anybody who does have access to it has signed an ironclad NDA and they're not allowed to talk about it. So, Yeah. So the best thing I've found is I just find a couple of YouTubers or content yeah. uh, creators who consistently stick to the topics, give good information. I know you like Matt Wolf. He's one of my favorites. He was out there early on. He's got a website called Future Tools. And our dream is to one day get like Raptor right on Future Tools. We'll work on that. But um, he does a lot of great stuff and he, he organizes it. So it's like art, writing. He doesn't do a lot about writing. I'll be honest about that. He mostly focuses on the art and the video. He's Because he's not an author himself. So he's really intrigued by this stuff and i really like him too because he's a layman like us he is someone who will say i don't really understand that that's really confusing and he'll do the same methodologies that we do like well i put this into chat gpt and so i could find out what the heck it means and this is what it said and this is what i did he does a lot of practical examples and shows it off he always discloses if he has sped up the video that's another big thing remember when google got their butts handed to them because they lied on the <laughs> oh, i think it was the new gemini was it? where it was like playing the geography game and all this other stuff and we're like this is really this was like last november this was like when it was very clear on the second or third watch that it was doctored content that they had kind of tweaked it so like it was showing image recognition like that's a duck what's now there's water now there's blue water or whatever and i think we were all stunned i was at first i was like oh my gosh then i was like wait a minute it's not really that fast they had sped up the time between asking the question and it responding and they made it seem like it was real time which is not the case um so yeah i like matt wolf and every friday he does this week in ai and it's a really cool way to see like the news and there's some little editorializing every once in a while I know he's not very happy about all the stuff that went down with Sam Altman last year with the board of OpenAI. <laughs> but he does separate. I will say this. If he has a video on his opinion, it'll be a separate video than the Fridays This Week in AI. So This Week in AI, he tries to be as straight reporting as he can. And then if he has like an opinion about something, it'll be a separate video. Yeah. Uh, do you watch him? Yeah, I do. Uh, I often just go to the Friday one just mm -hmm. because if I have more time but if I just don't have the time that week I'll just kind of catch the Friday ones maybe while I'm driving doing housework something along those lines that way I just feel like I'm keeping up on it yeah and I will say I agree with you he gives a lot of stuff that I don't care about which I'm glad I, I know it in like the the ether kind of a thing but I really like hone in and listen for like when he talks about a tool that I might be able to learn and understand and take to authors and show how this matters to authors yep uh, Elizabeth, who do you go to when you want to learn more about writing specific AI? So not just AI in general. So the truth is I don't go to anybody. To be honest yeah. with you. But, but I'm just say it, okay? I'm gonna be I'm gonna be a little egotistical and say I have yet to meet someone that is I don't know. I guess it's just very bold of me to say like I'm I'm the best at getting a new model and like 
taking it apart and evaluating it and finding cool things to do with it. So, so in that case, you do put up videos or yes. else, Future Fiction Future Academy F puts it up on the FFA YouTube channel. Yeah. And for a while there, we were putting up quite a bit and then I got sick and we had, I had to like prioritize my time, but I'm hoping to be back on the, the YouTube pretty often now soon of just the madness of the crazy. Last night, I figured out a new model and how to make it work and finding stuff and like, oh, this is cool. And we'll do this. And then this past weekend, I was up with you in New York and we were doing a whole new blackjack and a whole new methodology. <laughs> um, not to scare everybody, but we're, we're experimenting with the idea of temporary documents and this idea of the AI finishes something and then a different AI takes that. And how do we build a system like that for authors? that then that AI can evaluate this and another AI can say yes. And like we can do loops of documents, but in a way that the AI, that the, that the human controls it. So if we just scared everybody, sorry. But I will say that the FFA is not really, we don't do a lot of beginner stuff. Like we don't do a whole, whole lot at, at this point in time. We're not like, here's how you get in and things like that. So there are actually some really good YouTube channels out there that, um, I won't say I necessarily watch to give writing ideas, but I will watch to support them. And they are channels that I would happily endorse and say, hey, go check it out. So um, one of the first ones that I'll, I'll mention is actually somebody who's really kind of close to us, which is Ikello Harrod's Future Fiction Factory, which sounds like it. the names are very similar. So it sounds like he's associated with us. Uh, we're friends, but they're separate. And here's the story on that. Okay, so. Future Fiction Academy came out first by like a hair, like by like a few days. Okay. Now you don't know this because you weren't part of it yet. We asked ChatGPT for what we should name our company. And Future Fiction Factory was one of the suggestions. And we liked it, but we didn't like, we personally didn't like the factory aspect of it because we were all authors already. Ikello is becoming an author. No, this isn't a slam against him or anything like that. It's amazing. But us being already in it, we were like, oh, dear, we put factory. Ooh, people are going to be really pissed at us. People are going to be like really mad. And you were focusing on the education portion of it. Yeah. And at the and we we wanted something that was education. So we looked at school. We looked at institute. We looked at society. We looked at guild. So it was almost an FFG, Future Fiction Guild. Okay. Um, but we went with Academy. And uh, so Ikello messaged me and he was like, hey, I'm so da da da. He was worried about how it looked. I was like, oh no, I know you got that name for Chad GPT. <laughs> There's no bad blood at all that their names are very, the names are very similar. I think it's funny. Um, but yeah, I would say Future Fiction Factory is a really great place because it shows somebody who, he, he literally chronicled his his stuff. Um, he has a, he comes from a music background. He kind of is using AI as a way to make himself a better writer and to really like have time and stuff to write as he works a full-time job and he pursues his music interests and he's trying to write books and things like that. So I recommend his channel a lot. Um, another channel that I think is really good, uh, we know her as Miracle, AI Writer's Connection. Now, have you interacted with Miracle a little bit? Like with the prompt? A little bit, yes. I know she's taught some classes in the FFA and she has she's in our Discord. She teaches AI classes. She also has her own Discord too, which is a fantastic Discord. There's a lot of FFA members who are members over there too, or who are alumni of the FFA. Um, Miragold is someone I would put on par with me as far as like prompting goes. Like she is, she is very deep in the, she likes to do prompting that is JSON formatting. I don't typically put my prompts in JSON formatting, but Miragold is a hard believer in JSON formatting. And um, she does some really avant-garde things and advanced features with um, tropes and getting the AI to understand consistency, consistency of characters. And also she does a lot with screenplays going back and forth, screenplays, novels, that kind of a thing. So that's AI Writers Connection as a YouTube channel. And then probably the most popular YouTube channel that people know of is our friend it's Hamilton's the Hamilton. story. What is it? Nerdy Novelist. The Nervy Novelist. That's right. Is the name of the channel. Um, he was a member of the FFA early on, and he kind of went a different branch a little bit of, oh, talking about this, I just got a notification from Joseph Yu, another member of the Future Fiction Academy team, who is our developer, makes all of our cool stuff. 
Remember how I said we get the alerts, the APB goes out? Anthropic just announced prompt caching, trying to match what Google is doing. Oh, so that's a whole nother episode. A whole nother episode. But just so you know, it's just funny that it happened right as we're going to work together. <laughs> so one of the things is make friends with other people who are as nerdy as you are about AI. And then you just send each other <laughs> alert messages. <laughs> with drops. Poor Jason Hamilton. So nerdy novelist, uh, what do you like about that channel? Because I know you've been actually in his community and seen like he helps beginner authors a lot. Like, yeah, fantastically. He does a good job with matching it to... AI, how you do it for a reader magnet, how you do it for maybe your new, like the first steps you would take as an author, how to integrate into AI into that. And he specializes in fantasy. I do romance a lot because I'm a romance author and um, romance is the biggest genre. But <laughs> there's, you know, he does a lot of hero's journey. He does a lot of fantasy stuff talking about how do you like deal with the flowery language that Claude often likes to write. How do you twist that? How do you make it sound more like you? That kind of thing. And then another channel I want to shout out to, this is a channel that's actually more focused on a specific software. So back when I was a community manager for Pseudorite, there was a bunch of people who became ambassadors underneath the community management program. And they have since, uh, you know, they were members of the FFA at one point. And some people, you know, they like Pseudorite. They're focusing on Pseudorite and that's fantastic. But Nicole Broussard has a fantastic book out there, AI Writing for Authors, and a fantastic YouTube channel that she's building. And I will say that Jason Hamilton has put in the work like his channel is bumping and all of that because it is super at one point he did like a, a video every day for a month I remember he did that he really worked hard on building that YouTube channel this is not a dig against him or anything like that but I will say in general in the space um I am always happy to see more women stepping up more women talking about this because there's just not that many of us in the space kind of like advocating kind of unique in the author world that like there's joanna penn there's us there's more women in the author world who are talking more about ai i would say but the overall general, ai community in general yeah if i post on a forum or something like that one of the developer forums some of my methodologies and stuff like that people are like super welcoming and they're like super excited that there's somebody who is outside of the norm like wanting to work with the program and all of that so I just want to reach out to the ladies, particularly if you think you can't, you're, I, I hate to break it to you, but you're mistaken because we are language experts. We are really good communicators. And that's one of the areas where I would say is a blind spot for a lot of the engineering types when it comes to prompting. They just don't understand that what they have built is a chatty machine. And I think a lot of us from our earliest ages have, well, maybe not you, Stacey, but have been, I've been called a chatterbox. Yeah, no, I've never been. Chatty Kathy? Yeah. There, there, there's no Chatty Charles. Nobody's like, no, oh, Charles, it's your Chatty Kathy. Um, because that's how ADHD and autism shows in women. No, <laughs> it's a whole nother episode. Point just is, is that I would love to see more women in the space. And even though some of the women channels, including Feature Fiction Academy, we're not as big as Nerdy Novelists. We're not as big as Matt Wolf and all that. We may never be. But um, I would love to see more women in the space kind of contributing and all of that because it's it makes it for a more rich um, experience in the in the industry and everything like that. Everybody kind of gets covered that way. Yep. Okay. Well, um, so to recap, if you want to keep up on AI changes, number one, so go straight to the source of the AI stuff. Use ChatGPT if you can't understand it. And then um, second, finding friends. Like what the, are, are Facebook? Are you a part of any groups? AI writing for authors. Yeah. It's run by Steph Pajonis. You are one of the co-admins there there's some other great people I and agree. that one it as it gets bigger it has run into the same problem that a lot of facebook's you more people come in the more beginner questions so it, but there's a good mix of beginner cutting edge more advanced people in there yeah definitely if you ping and say hey i need some advanced help Kevin McLaughlin is in there. I am yep. here. Um, Nick Thacker is in there. Derek Slayton is in. There's a lot of people in there who Steph is obviously in there. Noise comments on everything. You're in there, Stacy. All yep. the FFA staff, I think, is in there. FFA students are in there. You will get if you really need an expert answer. You'll get an expert answer or my expert and an experienced answer. Yeah. <laughs> Not like any of us have PhDs in this stuff. I don't even think there's a there isn't a PhD in AI writing, as far as I'm aware. Not yet. I'm sure someone's working on designing something. 
when I moved here, I was like really excited to see that there was a master's program in digital publishing. And I was like, oh, I could go get a master's. But then I looked at the course stuff and I was like, I could teach all these courses. So I decided not to spend $35,000 and get a master's in digital publishing. Yeah, there was literally a class on digital publishing formats about Moby and EPUB and PDF and 13 week class on that or whatever, 20 week. I don't know. It's like the difference between academia. You know what? The Olympics just happened and we all saw with the break dancing. The difference between people who actually do it and the people who study it. Yes. So <laughs> academia. Damien needs a class on PDFs and ebooks and ePubs and all of that because they're trying to teach these people who have no practical experience. And I understand. Like if you aren't honestly digital publishing, if you aren't in a community, it's really hard to get information about it. Like it's not a That's true. Yeah. It's just not a well known job really take for granted how if you are learning from other indies or are connected with these podcasts with these facebook groups with friends mm -hmm. conferences how well shared this information can be yeah and we kind of have to be because there's not really like a school there's not many schools or something like that you can go to and learn how to be an indie author or learn how to be a yeah a digital publisher the point is we just take for granted the stuff, the information that's shared. And I think AI is another world there that it's almost like a sub niche of digital publishing at this point. This is how we're getting the information. You make friends and we're all pretty open. We're all pretty like welcoming. As long as you don't come in and be like, I would never use AI for writing. Please don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> if you really feel that way, just keep it to yourself. Yeah. It's okay for X, but not for Y. No. Uh -uh. We don't we don't cut the baby in half. It just doesn't work very well in the community. <laughs> there's yeah. not that much that there's not that many of us. So so yeah. Um get nerdy friends, go to the source, find some YouTube channels, reach out to people to find YouTube channels that are reliable. Uh broad AI. I would say Matt Wolf, I can't give another broad AI channel off the top of my head. Can you? That yeah. not offhand. No, I can't either. I will say it's not exactly AI, but there's like this. I can't remember the name of him now, so that's not even great. But there's some canvas videos with AI that I like. Oh, yeah. He's a guy with glasses. So if you see him with, you'll know who I'm talking about if you search Canva and AI. He's got one of the earliest videos and he's got glasses. He's really cool. And then the YouTube channels that are just for writing, there are, you know, the biggest one is obviously Nerdy Novelist. The rest of us are just a few thousand subscribers and stuff like that, but we're really granular on writing with AI. So Nerdy Novelist, FFA, Feature Fiction Academy, Feature Fiction Factory, Factory. <laughs> Author Writers Connection, and Nicole Broussard. Those are literally the top YouTube channels I would say that you need to be subscribed to. Okay. Well, that's a lot of great information and a lot of homework for everybody. So <laughs> go find some friends so you too get alerts as you're trying to do something. <laughs> AI has dropped. We have to go work on it now. So we'll go work on it. We'll go work on the token caching. <laughs> Okay, well, we'll see you next time. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thank you, Stacy, and happy prompting, everyone. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to Author Intelligence, brought to you by the Future Fiction Academy. We hope you have enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe, leave a comment, or better yet, share it with another writing friend. Stay creative and see you in the next episode.